Hi everyone, I'm coming to you from the educational bunker that I've built for the coronavirus in my basement. And I'm going to be talking today about the emergence of unipolarity uh, in the 1990s, the so-called unipolar moment. Our story starts in the 1980s uh, with the Reagan administration. Now keep in mind that from about 1969 to 1973 or 74, the US and the Soviet Union had been in a period of detente which involved many steps to reduce tensions, including uh, the uh, Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty of 1972, uh, and a number of other steps. This is the era of joint uh, space missions, uh, cultural exchanges ramp up. However, detente never really ends the Cold War, so to speak, or it never ends the overall U.S.-Soviet rivalry. And a lot of people argue that detente unravels because the Soviet Union, despite doing a lot of bilateral stuff to reduce tensions, still continues to push for expansion in the third world. This process, which has already helped to cause the unraveling of detente throughout the later 1970s, culminates in 1979 when the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan. This causes an immediate backlash uh, in the United States. Jimmy Carter, who is then still president, proposes big increases in defense budgets. He also suspends U.S. participation in the Moscow Olympics of 1980. Reagan, who wins election in November of 1980, wants to go much further than this. And he continues and even expands uh, Carter's proposals for increased defense budgets. So by 1981, we are firmly in what might be called Cold War II where the United States views itself as being in an existential struggle, struggle with the Soviet Union, uh, and plenty of American policymakers, including those occupying the White House, agree that the Soviet Union is a determined and forceful adversary who has a real capacity to beat the United States. And this view is shared by a number of analysts. And one reason why it's shared, of course, is that bipolarity has become relatively enduring over this period. But another, re and another reason, of course, is that for a variety of reasons, people are overestimating uh, Soviet military strength, which is in fact quite strong, but nowhere near as strong as uh, some claimed in the era. But also because uh, Reagan's uh, budgets uh, increased defense spending without significant cuts to domestic entitlement programs and with cuts and with quite significant decreases in taxes. And this creates a fiscal imbalance in the United States and what at the time seemed like really high deficits. Indeed, Robert Gilpin in his 1981, 1980 book, War and Change in International Politics argues that the Soviet Union is a successful challenger of the United States, and the United States now has to do a better job of accommodating the Soviet Union, or else it's going to suffer from severe overextension. And he points specifically to these kinds of fiscal imbalances as things that are just not sustainable over the long run. But there are other reasons why people in the time think of the United States as a declining hegemon. Among them, is what we've talked about before in the class, which is the breakup and collapse of the Bretton Woods system in the early 1970s. Now, what we learned, I think, looking back, is that the collapse of the Bretton Woods system did not derail U.S. economic hegemony, and if people like Carla Norloff are right, it actually may have enhanced U.S. global economic power. And nonetheless, the total implosion of an order that the U.S. had constructed at the end of World War II centered around its own economic and military power struck many as evidence of U.S. hegemonic decline, as well as some of the factors I've already talked about and some I'll talk about in a second. And so there was a notion that we were leaving a period of U.S. hegemony uh, and entering a period that might be more multipolar. This kind of argument uh, comes together in a work like Paul Kennedy's Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, which was published in 1987, in which you read an excerpt from, in which he argues that the United States is very much facing a condition, like many great powers before, of strategic overextension, of overinvestment in military power at the expense of domestic investment and domestic cultivation of its potential for growth. And then unless the United States does something about that strategic overextension, uh, perhaps including getting its allies to share more of the defense burden, then it is doomed to the same fate as great powers before it. One of the allies, which is much of the contention among burden sharing is centered, is Japan. And as you'll see in a moment, there are reasons why people think, uh, based on projections of economic growth, by the late 1980s that Japan is going to overtake the United States in the future. And Japan has certainly has emerged as the second largest economic power in the world and is definitely uh, giving the United States a sense of inadequacy and a sense of decline. Indeed, people like Ezra Vogel in his book Japan is Number One look at Japanese management practices, Japanese corporate practices, the way that the J Japan runs the its own economy, 
everybody's well aware of these things. And there's a notion that maybe even the United States has to learn from Japan uh, unless it wants to be outcompeted. Certainly Japanese cars are now starting to outcompete American cars globally. Japanese products are now are no longer cheap transistor radios. At the same time, because of Japan's newfound uh, economic strength, a number of, of uh, scholars and writers and politicians in Japan uh, start to really complain about U.S. pressure, not only U.S. pressure on burden sharing, but the pressure the United States is pushing on Japan to be more accommodating on the trade front and to allow, say, more U.S. goods to be sold within Japan. And this creates a backlash, you know, sort of along the lines of we are more successful than the United States is, and it just wants to pressure us and treat us uh, like a second-class state, like a client state, uh, and we're not going to put up with that. So this is kind of the atmosphere in the 1980s. Now, you can see two interesting things about this, if, if you look at the trends in economic growth, really this one goes back to 1913 through 1990. The first thing you notice is that it is true that Japan is rapidly gaining on the United States. The other interesting thing here is that if you want to talk about the story that the Soviet Union is a successful peer competitor, which has established a durable bipolar system with the United States as the other great power, if you want to tell that story, this graph is a little bit weird for you because, of course, the Soviet economy is not doing as comparatively well as the advanced industrialized democracies. And indeed, the gap with the United States is not closing over this period. It's actually growing. However, this, this whole thing uh, has to be put in the context of a kind of broader focus, kind of U.S.-centric focus. Because af after World War II, with Europe's industrial capacity largely destroyed, but after World War II, the United States controls something on the order of 35% of world gross domestic product. I've seen estimates, perhaps using GNP, as high as 50% of the global economy. Uh, and this is inevitable that this is going to decline over time simply because other countries are going to, you know, as other countries recover from the devastation of the Second World War. Nonetheless, when you're talking about moving from 35% to by the 1980s, you know, 23, 20, 22 percent, that's a pretty big decline in overall economic power. And you can see why people are looking at the United States and thinking that it is a power in decline. Moreover, when you start thinking about attempts to measure global power that take into account both capacity and active military capabilities, like the so-called sink scores, um, you can see that according to, in fact, the most widely used uh, way of measuring national power or national capabilities um, by political scientists that the Soviet Union actually overtakes the United States uh, in 1973. And with that kind of thing, you can see how despite the Soviet Union's lagging economy, it might be seen as a successful peer competitor. So what changed? Well, our story is really about two things. The first is Japan. In the early 1990s, Japan begins to enter into its lost decade. That is a period of about 10 years with very middling uh, economic growth. So instead of being on trend to overtake the United States after the year 2000, uh, it actually falls off trend. Uh, and then later on, it will become caught in a demographic vise and be overtaken by China. But for now, in the 1990s, Japan does not, in fact, close the gap the way people expected. At the same time, the United States has an unexpected economic boom associated with new technology, particularly Silicon Valley, uh, in the personal computer revolution. This is the era of the early internet, for example. And the United States does better than expected, while Japan does much worse than expected. So Japan is now off the table as a peer competitor of the United States. Just as importantly, and more startlingly, of course, is the collapse of the Soviet outer empire in Eastern Europe uh, in 1989, uh, followed by the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. Now, you will recall from some previous discussions, and certainly I hope from your previous classes, that Gorbachev comes to power in the Soviet Union as a reformer. Uh, he doesn't believe that the Soviet system is working to deliver the goods, and he worries about its long-term stability. Uh, he worries about its ability to produce enough goods and agriculture, etc., to take care of itself. And so he wants space to engage in political reforms, that is what comes to known as glasnost, and economic change uh, towards a more maybe social democratic economy, which is called perestroika. Now, in order to get the running room to implement these reforms, Gorbachev feels he needs to dial back tensions with the United States, and he pursues his new thinking in foreign policy and does peace overtures to the United States. In 1987, uh, Reagan has decided to finally decided to take Gorbachev up on that, and you get the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty in Europe, and you get a period of time of sort of rapid uh, change in U.S.-Soviet relations. Now, by 1989, is 
its its restructuring is not going quite as well as its political openness, which is leading to all kinds of dissent and is sending signals throughout Eastern Europe uh, that it might be possible to challenge the regimes there. And indeed, there's an outbreak uh, that we can, you can read the, the history yourself of exactly what happens and the way that the unrest and protest spreads. But essentially, there's a series of what are really nationalist uprisings against Soviet domination uh, and uprisings against Soviet client regimes, which are seen, of course, as repressive and not delivering the goods and all other kinds of things. So Gorbachev decides for a variety of reasons that he is not going to send the tanks in and that he will allow the, um, he will allow the, uh, the, the outer empire to go. This is, of course, the, the scene from the Berlin Wall as the Berlin Wall uh, is, uh, collapses and is destroyed. Uh, the, many of the revolutions are peaceful. This is the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia. Some are less so, such as the uh, overthrow of Ceausescu in Romania. But by 1991, this nationalist wave that's overtaken Eastern Europe has, in fact, fed back on the Soviet Union itself and encouraged uh, nationalist protests and uprisings throughout the Soviet Union. In response, seeing things slipping away, seeing Gorbachev as a failure, angry over the loss of the Warsaw Pact, uh, there is a coup attempt by the old garden hardliners against Gorbachev. During the coup, Gorbachev is largely sidelined, and Boris Yeltsin comes to prominence, uh, staring down uh, the coup. At the same time that Boris Yeltsin is doing this, he is, as I understand it, in negotiations or deal-making with nationalists in places like Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia, uh, who are also opposing the coup, and they want independence. And by December, all of this comes together uh, in the Soviet Union dissolves on Christmas uh, Day, I believe. Now, the dissolution of the Soviet Union leaves the United States without a pure competitor. And to understand what that means in practice and why that is actually one of the most important factors for the development of the unipolar era, you simply have to look at um, a crude measure, total uh, military spending. Now, you can see that U.S. military spending actually declines throughout the 1990s as a result of the so-called peace dividend. So it's not that the United States is sort of still uh, ramping up its defense capabilities, or at least the amount of resources it's pumping into the defense sector. Instead, it's simply the collapse of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union essentially falls off the spending map, and Russia enters into a period of economic decline and political uh, instability, uh, leading to um, a simply just no meaningful Russian military spending from a global perspective. And the same thing, the, the military is in bad shape, the nuclear complex falls apart. This is why the United States engages in what becomes the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program as a way of trying to prevent uh, nuclear scientists from leaving and helping other states develop nuclear weapons or people stealing nukes and otherwise sort of tries to lock down, help the Russians lock down their nuclear complex. Things are really grim in Russia in the 1990s. Indeed, you can see this economically, that per capita income falls precipitously during the 1990s and bottoms out at less than 60% of per capita income. It's only under Putin, uh, and because oil prices recover, that Russia is able to finally achieve and then surpass the per capita income that it enjoyed in the last few years of the Soviet uh, period. So this is quite a precipitous collapse. But it's not just the not, the story that we're telling is not just a story about defense spending or the share of uh, the world economy. It's also a story about U.S. military technical prowess. So this is a, a map of Operation Desert Storm, which is the operation, the, what we sometimes call in the United States the first Gulf War, uh, to liberate uh, Kuwait from Iraq. Now I think I've mentioned this before in class, but at the time Iraq had uh, some of the most modern. Uh, military equipment, Soviet military equipment outside of the Soviet Union, and have what was seen as a very formidable uh, military force. This is actually from later, and I'll come back to that in a second, but we were showcased a lot of images that look like this, of U.S. precision and so-called smart weapons destroying, destroying Iraqi capabilities. Uh, particularly, we were introduced to the power of the cruise missile, and the Iraqi army was utterly devastated. Now, what in truth the Iraq War revealed was that the United States had combined arms operation capabilities and remote strike capabilities, uh, integrated operations that's in, in new technologies and like GPS, other types of things that basically enabled it to have capabilities that nobody else had. And if you read reactions in France and China and elsewhere, there's this realization that the United States is just way ahead 
of anything that they expected. And to some degree, the, U the U.S. success really surprises the United States itself. Now, ironically, a lot of these capabilities, the, the sort of capabilities that we saw on display uh, in the Iraq War, uh, really don't come to fruition until much later, until the Kosovo conflict. But still, even as they were, uh, even though they were only moving in that direction uh, in the early 1990s, it's very clear that the United States has a very significant technological advantage over other uh, advanced militaries, one in which other militaries uh, will eventually do their best to catch up to. The other thing to understand is in geopolitical terms. So while this is, of course, a map of NATO expansion, and while the first major round of NATO expansion does not occur until 1999, uh, after the end of the Cold War, the United States institutes, along with NATO, the Partnership for Peace program, uh, which is essentially an effort to, what becomes ultimately an effort to ready states for potential membership in, in NATO. And that, along with the European Union uh, Association, uh, and uh, accession process means that you have all sorts of Europeans and NATO forces running around Eastern Europe, retraining uh, soldiers, pushing interoperability, NATO standards uh, in a way that uh, really kind of makes Eastern Europe fall into the Western European and American orbit. The other thing that happens uh, of note is in the Bosnian conflict where this is a picture of Sarajevo uh, and the kind of destruction you got uh, in Sarajevo uh, and elsewhere during the Yugoslavian Civil War, the collapse of Yugoslavia, that the Europeans really kind of fail or are widely perceived to fail to be able to deal with a problem in their own backyard. So Bosnia is a test for the ability of Europe to act on its own uh, in a strategic way to deal with a, a major civil conflict. It doesn't do so well, and ultimately the United States steps in, thus convincing a lot of people that the United States really is, as Madeleine Albright will say later, uh, the indispensable nation, that the Europeans cannot do it on their own. The other parts of the story, too, you have the World Trade Organization, the expansion of liberalism and liberalization, but I think really for our case, what's most important is to understand that there were a series of developments that shifted the trajectory, as understood in the 1980s, of one of U.S. hegemonic decline to a notion that the United States suddenly had no peer competitors, was suddenly unfettered, and suddenly could kind of, in a sense, do whatever it wanted. By the later 2000s, this means that the entire world, uh, this is a heat map of U.S. military basing and personnel, and you can see that the United States is kind of everywhere. Uh, it has military bases all over the world. It is the only country through most of the 2000s with significant force projection capability. Uh, and that can really be sent to be said to have a kind of global military presence. This is eroding to some degree now. China is starting to develop a, a, a basing network in a very small and incipient way. But nonetheless, this is kind of where we're left with. And you can see then why people see the United States as emerging from the end of the Cold War as really this kind of colossus, this global hegemonic power of the kind that the world had never seen. That's it.